Hey everybody, I'm Greg Soul, and this is Why Am I, a podcast where I talk to interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go-around is Jimmy Gownley. Jimmy is a cartoonist who got started around 15 years old, give or take, and now after 35 years, he's worked uh, you know, tirelessly to become a New York Times best-selling author. Right? Quite an achievement, I would say. He's created his own series and written for the likes of Disney, but his current project, honestly, is what really has my attention at the moment. It's a graphic novel he hopes to complete this year. And, you know, honestly, if you watch him on Twitter, you can watch his progress. Um, but it's on fighting depression with creativity. It's uh, something all too real for a lot of folks. And honestly, hearing the way he articulates it is probably one of the best things to come out of this podcast. I would say skip to that part, if nothing else. Uh, I could have literally talked to Jimmy all day, but alas, I'm all out of special drink. So uh, it had to come to an end. And if you enjoyed this episode or any of the previous ones, I please ask that you share with a friend to help me grow. And now I hope you enjoy this chat with Jimmy. Jimmy Gownley, thank you for joining me in the uh, Why Am I podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been yeah. looking forward to doing it. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, here we go. Uh, so, you and I are at uh, Comic-Con, and right. uh, we're looking at comic books. Uh, a very uh, underrated part of the comic-con experience because it's not it doesn't really seem like it's about that much anymore it's more about <laughs> dressing up and just seeing interesting stuff anyway i digress we keep bumping <laughs> into each other in the similar booths and we strike a conversation talk about me for a minute and we exhaust that rather quickly and now it's your turn to reciprocate so uh jimmy who are you bud uh well i'm jimmy gownley i'm a cartoonist i created the series amelia rules which was uh a very early kind of YA kids comic um, series that ran for eight volumes. And uh, I've done a couple other books since then for Scholastic, The Dumbest Idea Ever, and Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up. And I'm also the host of a podcast uh, about peanuts uh, called Unpacking Peanuts. Not the food, but the comic strip peanuts by Charles Schultz. <laughs> All right. Reimagine your podcast as it is about the food. What does that even mean? Oh, I, oh wait! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I'm so sorry. Say that. No, no. I was just making a joke. If it was about peanuts, like uh, oh, with the podcast, uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know just... what? I mean, I think I could do it because there's no problem with me just talking and talking and talking. So I could probably fill an hour a week about the food peanuts. Oh, you got your God. boiled peanuts. You got your peanut butter. Yeah, I can make it work. <laughs> I was really just testing to see how fast you pivot and you do it rather quickly. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. All right. So first and foremost, you said cartoonist. Um, tell me about uh, being a cartoonist. Why do you enjoy doing that? Do you still enjoy doing that? You've been doing it a really long time. I have. I, I, I published my first comic book when I was 15 as, you know, just an amateur uh, self-publisher. So which means like I've been doing it for like 35 years now. Um but I do still enjoy it. I, I do. I, I actually feel that if I go a few days without drawing, uh, not just drawing, like, but actually like drawing a comic, but like really, you know, focusing on, I, I, I don't feel as good. It, it actually affects hmm. my mental health and just my, uh, my well being. So I do still like doing it. Um, you know, of course, as it goes along, years and years, uh, it gets to be more pressure and it becomes less about just doing this thing that you love for fun and more about, you know, a job and all that sort of stuff. So that can be stressful. Uh, but yeah, no, I do. I do love it. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a great, I, I, when I was a little kid, the only other thing I wanted to be was Jedi Knight, you know? And, uh, I feel like th this is as close as I could get, you know, is it's, it's <laughs> an ancient, society of people who were once held in much much greater esteem who use very old tools to manipulate reality uh so i love it i still love it <laughs> well i mean one i don't think jedi pays well i think he kind of just well you know room and board maybe always either so <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um yeah that's interesting so you've been doing it since you were 15 years old yeah. got started fell in love with it kept doing it and that's something i've found too it's like because i've done stuff before that like first it started it was a hobby and then it became kind of an occupation and it definitely has this 
shift in my head. Um, and when you know something else that stood out to me is like you were saying you actually feel bad when you don't cartoon. What's that feeling? Is it like you feel guilty? Like I'm I'm not producing. I should be producing because like when I do that stuff, that's usually kind of the little voice in my head. Yeah, I think it's this weird sort of of thing that if you don't do something that you either should be doing or or um, that you're used to doing or whatever, you first you get that little pleasure because you're playing hooky or whatever. <laughs> but but then the other part of you comes in and makes you feel bad about missing it. And now you're it's sort of this build up of well I haven't done it for a while and now I'm behind and now I can't even get started and it starts this whole cycle, and it's way better I think to just you know make sure you're drawing. Uh, even if I can't do it every single day, uh, like if I'm not like really working on a a book that I'm drawing, I'll still do it every other day. Because uh, a lot of my time, not a lot of my time, but a, a portion of my time these days is also spent writing comics uh, for Disney. Ones that I don't draw just because I could, you can write a lot faster than you can draw. Hmm. Um, so on those, I'm not drawing as much, but I make sure while I'm in the process of doing that, that I... I still have my Bristol board, so I can I get a couple hours in. Does that still satiate kind of that similar creative part of your brain, like being able to just write as opposed to actually cartoon? Do you storyboard a little bit in there so they kind of get an idea of what you want? Or I don't send it to them, but sometimes I do in my notebook. Uh, you know, I I write everything in a notebook before I I type it up or anything. I just typing is is very sterile to me and not. Mm not a pleasurable experience. I never really learned to do it right either. Uh, so I like the creative part. I like doing on paper. Um, it's a different type of, of creativity. It's not as, to be honest, it's not as fulfilling as drawing it yourself. Uh, what I love mm. about drawing is I have, or drawing a comic book specifically is I have an idea. Um, and then I try to let the page be a complete, you know, work of art in quotes. I'm not saying it's art, but I try to make a complete unit, let's say, a complete satisfying experience. And I just let it flow while I'm doing the drawing. And and sometimes even the, the content of the page changes a little bit because of that. But that's that kind of interplay between the two is is what I like the most. It's harder to do that when you're writing, especially because I want the artist to have fun uh, doing it it's hmm. not watchmen that i'm writing it's it's you know donald duck story stories so i want the artist to just have a blast doing it and want to you know want to keep doing them um with me so i don't i don't try to over over plan or over um you know dictate what is going to be on the page so that does take a little of the fun of it out of it for me but i wouldn't have had fun telling someone else to do it either it would only be fun if i was doing it but I'm not doing that for Disney because it will take 10 times as long <laughs> would defeat the entire purpose of working for Disney. <laughs> That's such a fun thought that you want the artist to have. Do you actually, you want the artist to have, do you actually interact with them at all? Do you get to talk to the artist? No, it's very strange. Uh, they, they, well, they don't ever say you can't, but they don't ever really facilitate it. Like in the old days hmm. when you would, I, this is just from me reading as a fan, but you got the feeling and I think I know from reading articles and interviews that these people used to work um, very closely. I think of mm. uh, like Alan Moore working with you know, Steve Bissett on Swamp Thing or something like that. And, you know, they, they would talk the stories out. They would hash things out together. They don't really want you doing that at Disney these days. Mm. So uh, it's all with the editor. And then the editor has a uh, has a relationship with the artist. I, I've never met any of the artists. I do any of the stuff uh with for disney so that's another reason why i try to keep it uh, keep it loose because i don't know who's even really drawing it you know so like if i knew i had a guy that oh boy crowd scenes you know you could say all right i want a double page spread it's a baseball game there's all these people whatever right but if you don't know that you're not putting a baseball game with thousands of people in the stands because you may be torturing someone you know who just hates to draw that kind of thing so yeah yeah, it it's it's makes me wonder, do you kind of, um, as you're writing something, you sort of laugh to yourself, imagining what the artist is going to draw, maybe that they would have fun doing this particular part? Or I guess I guess you're just being empathetic and say, I would really love to draw this thing. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 more it's more of that, actually. I mean, the, the funny stuff, you know, sometimes I'll even work, especially with that. I, I'll just start writing things like Donald says something stupid. Mickey 
has a wry comment, whatever, right? And just get a, a, a structure of it and then go back basically until I find words that make me laugh or at least chuckle and think think is funny. And um, then I just hope, you know, uh, when you, when actually when you send it out to an editor and you send it out to an artist, really what you're hoping is, does this even make sense? Is this <laughs> anything at all? You know, and when they come back and say it's good, you're like, Whew, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you ever... And I know I've talked to some artists that, uh, you know, that work in media and they won't go back and say, watch a previous performance or, or, uh, watch a TV show they were in or something like that. Do you actually grab a copy of the book and check it out once it's done? I, I look at, yeah, I look at those. Um, yeah, because I, I like, but that's, it's, it's sort of a different experience then because I truly am just looking at it and going, oh, that's cool because it's someone else who drew it. And those, it is enjoyable to be able to look at that. They're always great artists. I mean, they're Disney artists. Everyone is beautifully drawn. That's fun because you get to go, oh, wow, look at all that. It looks really, really good. It's harder to read your stuff um, when I did all of it myself because mm. it's more, much more personal. And there's not that element of remove of seeing someone else's you know, the vision of the characters. Right. Because you uh, can give somebody else the grace that you can't give yourself. Right. It's like, you just, well, that's you see every mistake you true. made. I would have changed this. I would have tweaked that. Yeah. 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 That is true. And actually, when you think about it, I, you know, I never see any flaws with the, <laughs> with the art. <laughs> I'm sure the artists who see it are, are frustrated and wish they could have done better, but Hey, great job, buddy. I, I've never looked at one of those projects and thought, Oh, I wish someone else would have drawn it. Cause they, they always, they always really do a nice job. That's cool. And I even have my own version of Disney of uh, Mickey and Donald in these little. It's uh, it's mostly for the European market. These young Donald stories, uh, where this the artist Jay Fosgett, his name is, you know, designed completely original versions of Mickey and Donald and the whole crew just for our books. That was really cool to see. It's like oh, there's really no cool. Donald that looks like that except in my Donald books. That's very cool. That's fun. Yeah. Have you ever? I mean, like. That fellow, have you ever connected with him and had a conversation or anything like that? No, no, never. No? Any desire to? What if Just he curious. doesn't like me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, oh, no, Jimmy, you're human. Oh, oh. <laughs> that would be I'm, awful. No, that yeah. would be awful. I don't want him to think about it. Just, <laughs> Just you keep doing it. It's great. Oh, my God. <laughs> doesn't matter how long we do this stuff. That That voice is still in our head, huh? Always. <laughs> yeah, the old, uh, what's it called? The imposter syndrome. You yeah. know, you always have that feeling of, well, everybody else knows what they're doing and I'm faking it, but everybody's just faking it. Yeah, for sure. You just fake it long enough and you, you know, you get patterns, you get rhythms, you get used to I'm, it. I'm sure Mozart was like, oh, I'm a total fraud on some days. <laughs> he had to be, right? Uh, I'm sure there's some people that aren't like that and they're sociopaths and we should be protected <laughs> from them. For, you know, protect them from society. They aren't normal. No, I, oh, I have it. noticed actually the more you the, the the more you do think of your work, uh, especially in comics for whatever reason, the less likely <laughs> you are to make it. The people I know, hmm. and you know, I've been doing. I, you know, I started Amelia in two thousand one, and I was doing comics for comic book shops well before that. But the people I've I found that had success or at least longevity were the people who were um, in it because they loved the art, they loved the format, the, the you know the form of comics, and they were not critical of their well, yes, critical of their own work, but not critical to the point that it became them beating themselves down, uh, but realistic about their work. The the people I found who were the most pleased and proud early on just evaporate. You know, I, I don't know why that is. And some of them are like really talented. They come in there. It's like one issue or two issues and it looks great. And that's it. It just goes away because whatever I think, whatever they thought it was going to be, they have all this skill. And then you put it into a product and you put it out into the world. And 99 percent of the time, it's going to be some sort of disappointment. I mean, you're not mm. going to be the Beatles. You're not going to be like someone screaming your name and stuff like that. And then I think you realize, oh, God, I have to just go do another comic book right after this. And it's like, pass, forget it. <laughs> so I, I think it's got to be that comp that uh, that type of person who loves the art enough to constantly do it, is critical enough that they want to get better at it, but not so critical that they shut themselves down. That's interesting. Yeah. I've heard I, I heard somebody say one time, I think I was listening to NPR or something, and they said, everybody's got one book in them, but yeah. almost nobody has two. 
And uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking that's interesting from multiple aspects, right? Like I was thinking, well, does that mean just people don't have enough life experience to like really come up with something? Or will they realize that it's so much freaking work that after the first one, they're just like, forget it. Like, I don't want to have to go through that torment again. Uh, yeah, I, one thing I noticed too is with people, um, uh, these are more people, like I play in some bands and stuff with them, you know, guys around town, not to ever, like a dad rock band, not not to play out and torture people. Just dad, dad rock, rock band. band. Yeah, but, um, you know, sometimes they'll, the other guys, they look for reasons not to do something, or I look for reasons to do it. I don't care, like, well, okay, we're not good, let's do it, let's, let's play out, whatever. Well, there's a million reasons not to always. And I just always put those to the side and it's just like let's find the reason to do it and just mm. enjoy the fact that we're doing it as its own end you know and i think like if you if you're, if you're that person that's going for that second book yeah you now have had the experience of sitting your butt in a chair for hours and hours and hours and you might not want to and you also might not realize that not every work of art needs to be a complete reinvention of everything or or completely different than the thing that you did before. Human experience is remarkably finite. You know, everybody really sort of experiences the same things, maybe not to the same degree, but everyone understands emotion. You know, um, you know I haven't been oppressed as, you know, Jimmy Gownley, white cartoonist, but I understand anger and I understand frustration, right? So I should be able to have empathy and, and write for those, for other people who, who do feel that sort of thing. And I, I think that's part of it. People think, well, if I'm experiencing this, maybe it's just me. I'm not going to put it out there. Um, but the truth is, when you do put it out there, you find out that it is a really universal experience. So I think I think probably people have six, seven, eight books in them. Hmm. But there's that whatever sensor in your mind that that shuts it down. And it's like, no, no, I'm not that special. And I, I heard, I don't remember, my friend Barry Liga, who's a writer, said this to me, but I think he was quoting someone else that basically, if you've survived eighth grade, you could write books for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> that seems about right. It feels, man, that feels true. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever felt more seen. <laughs> <laughs> Something you said there, like really resonated with me. Everyone experiences the same thing. I, I feel like that's, true right like to different degrees everybody yeah. feels it in different ways um and something i've found too is just because you think it's a universal experience that everybody has the words you use to describe it might unlock something in somebody else's brain because that's happened to me so many times in my life it's something i've felt or experienced and i knew it to be true but until i heard somebody put it in a very specific way it didn't I didn't understand it in quite the same way. And you never know um, what that's going to be, right? You never know what interpretation you have, which specific one is going to resonate with which person. It's going to be different with everybody too. Well, very true. You know, I was having a conversation uh, not long ago with an editor of mine at Scholastic, and we were just talking generally about, you know, kids and, and, um, and reading. And he said something like, well, kids can't be nostalgic. I'm like, what do you mean kids can't be nostalgic? And he's like, well, they don't have enough life experience to be nostalgic. And I'm like, I was nostalgic as a kid. I know I was nostalgic for a kid for things I didn't experience. Mm -hmm. But, and he's just like, no, and like there was, there was no way, and it wasn't an argument. It was just, it didn't, had no stakes to it, this conversation. We were just talking. But he was like, no, you know, I, I just don't see it though. They can't be nostalgic. And I realized it's the word nostalgia that we're getting tripped up on. There is something in a child that is longing for something in the past that they didn't necessarily even experience that, you know, that happens. You could see it in Star Wars where Luke Skywalker like looks at the sun and I mean, right. I mean, young people do experience that. It's the but the language, the word nostalgia was what was throwing us off. And, and it's it's very you're, what you're saying is very true. You it's not just what you're expressing. It's how you are expressing it that will either connect with someone or not. Mm. And I 100% know what you're talking about, that nostalgia for a time that you didn't live through. Like right. I've, I've had that before. And I think um, maybe the way I kind of tweaked that, because I used to use the word nostalgia too, and the way I could maybe change that is I have kind of 
romanticized a certain time period or something right yeah, like yeah. like this this affinity for this period in time that i didn't actually exist then so i can't i guess truly have nostalgia right like a a hearkening right. back to old times that i right. wants to experience but um yeah like um kind of like uh the aesthetic of the 50s like yeah. I've, I've sort of uh romanticized that in my head for yeah. sure well i mean when i grew up in the 80s and the eight there was a whole version of fashion that was like the 80s 50s you know, something like even like Twin Peaks, right? You know, I mean, it's the 80s, but slash 90s, but it's really also 50s. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the one of the things that pops in my head is you mentioned Disney already, um, is they used to have these things where it was like um, technology of the future or whatever. They have these little specials where they'd show you like, this is what the, the living room of the future will be or the kitchen of the future. Yes. And like, yeah, I was a kid of the 80s too. And I always thought, man. I wish that was what the 80s was actually like. That actually is so like, cool. Yeah. Absolutely. I always used to think that was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah. But again, a period I never lived in. Maybe it's just like the optimism for the future that they seem to have. Maybe maybe I kind of like that. Well, I think there is there is something like that. You know, there all that science fiction from the mid 20th century was like super hopeful. Um, you know, even if it was just those cartoons like saying, you know, cars of future or whatever. Uh, because it was implying there was a future, you know, even if the future is <laughs> wonky, you have a future. That's great. You know, these days it's a little, I think it's a little rougher. We are, our, our fantasy is mostly about like destruction and, mm. you know, trying to prevent the next destruction, even though you couldn't prevent the last one. It's, 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 I mean, you know, I, I, I see our whole pop culture for the last 20 years. as like, uh, Japan after World War II with, uh, you know, the Godzilla movies and all the radiation and all, which so clearly was them processing, you know, Hiroshima and stuff. I think it took 20 years of us in movies and culture processing 9-11. Uh, I mean, you see it again and again and again in all like the superhero movies we, we all watch. It's very strange, hmm. but less optimistic than those 50s. Hey, you know, anything can happen. Yeah, it feels like a lot of stuff nowadays is... um and uh like i would say like 40 percent of what's on netflix is shows about people being murdered and like right. investigating their murder or you know like Dahmer or i don't know just straight yeah, or yeah. zombies or post-apocalyptic it does seem to have kind of a downward trend i never i didn't really think about it well and you know art makes the culture whether like you know something exists out in uh you know thought space or whatever the simple and then you through your art create it you're manifested into the world be careful what you're manifesting. <laughs> Just huh. be careful, you know? Like, I'm not saying it in a mystical way, but you're putting ideas into the world, so put good ones in, Yeah. right? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I think sometimes artists underestimate the impact they can have on people, even if it's a small group of people. They yeah. really can change things. And I, I was, it made me think about something you are talking about, that um, your audience is, is YA, and so I don't know how much interaction you you might get with them but i'm curious like as a as a as a you know a cartoonist and you know developing ya stuff how much feedback do you really get kind of from your audience do you get a lot a little a fair amount yeah i mean i well i used to do tons of school visits obviously before the pandemic and and stuff um so you would see it then i mean i mean when i say tons i mean you know i did hundreds and hundreds over the years oh wow yeah uh so i'm not dying to rush back to that but you know with the internet <laughs> and stuff you get you get um you know some fan art sent to you or, or letters and stuff like that but i used to have this really hokey thing um when i was creating a well i it started off i guess to back up my first comic i did was this thing called shades of gray comics and stories which was basically a comic about me and my friends and if anyone wants to read the story of how that came about uh, it's a book from scholastic called the dumbest idea ever which is about how i became a cartoonist um but as that grew and into the 90s, when I was self-publishing it as a comic book, that was very Gen X. It was very, you know, alternative nation time, which is like <laughs> my wheelhouse, right? It was, someone once said I should come free with a DVD of Reality Bites. I'm so Gen X. <laughs> <laughs> my friend Ron said that. Um, and, uh, you know... So, okay, so now I was thrown off from that. What were we talking about with that before? Uh, uh, feedback. We talking... Right, Okay. So, you know, 
I have now I've completely lost the plot as to how this had to do with feedback. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no worries. We were talking <laughs> Are about we able uh, to edit this out. Absolutely not. This stays. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I want people to know that I'm not the only one that gets uh, brain farts and, and oh, brain fog. No, total, total brain fog ever since, uh, <laughs> since the COVID. I think that's what's what's causing it. Dude, I am um, still recovering. It was months ago. But. Anyway, so you put out these books and in the heart of Gen X alternative nation and that sort of stuff, uh, audience feedback, it was about expressing yourself. It wasn't about the audience necessarily at all. As a matter of fact, if the audience didn't get it, that was a good thing. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, hey, man, that's how, how hip this is. And after a while, I felt, well, that's self-defeating, obviously. But it was this sort of platitude that everyone said was like, you cannot think about your artist. Or about your audience, rather. You have to just, you know, please yourself. And I thought, well, yeah, but art's a communication. It's got to be a two-way street. You know, you have to, if you're sending out a signal, someone has to receive it and understand the signal. Um, so I just started thinking, well, all right, I'm going to write this new comic, which ended up being a million rules, and it's for the saddest little girl in the world. <laughs> it's the saddest little girl in the world. I don't know who she is. I don't know where she is, but someone's going to drop her off at a library someday because she has also no money, right? And she's just going to be able to walk around and find something. And she's going to find my book. And that's my chance to talk to her. The saddest hmm. little girl in the world. Right. Um, and that, so that's who I'm thinking of. Not a whole audience of 12 year olds. So that I'll, I'll make a bunch of money. Just this one girl, this one imaginary girl. Well, you'd be shocked how many times I met that girl. She hmm. is not always a girl, <laughs> you know, uh, she is not always a little kid, but, almost exactly that story people have told me again and again and again and over the years and i just started thinking it's like well you know that was great that was smart. it may not have been the most commercially smart thing because i wasn't thinking of you know an audience of thousands that i could monetize but for those kids that read it and it mattered to them it was exactly the right decision so you know that and when you get that kind of feedback it means the whole world Usually when you get feedback about a book that came, it's so, it's too, it's like, all right, well, thanks. Like, you know, if they have a criticism or a suggestion or anything like that, there's nothing that can be done about it. But when you hear from someone who it really meant something to, that's awesome. Hmm. How does it, um, I'm always curious, like uh, when artists, uh, you get compared to other people, what's that like for you? Like if somebody well, says, oh, you remind me of this artist, it's like. I, you know, I always take it as a compliment, even if it if it was a, one of my favorite reviews <laughs> um, of my work ever. This was before Amelia even. It was on the internet that said, "This guy draws like Rob Liefeld drunk." And I thought, <laughs> well, why bring Rob Liefeld into this? He didn't do anything, you know. <laughs> I thought, all right, well, Rob Liefeld's a successful cartoonist. He doesn't seem to be in mind. Fine, fine, I'll be Rob Liefeld drunk. That's okay. That's cool. <laughs> I think you got to be, um, you know. You got to be sort of uh, gracious whenever anybody is talking to you about your art, just because that's why you're putting it out there, right? You know, for mm. to hear what somebody has to say about it, to see what they think. Um, one embarrassed, I, I got a lot of Peanuts comparisons when Amelia came out. And, uh, you know, because Schultz is a huge influence for me, and it's obviously, you know, on the face of it in Amelia. And uh, there was a quote that was, you know, the Peanuts for the 21st century. And I brought, I had it with me at the Eisner Awards, carrying the book for some reason. And uh, who should sit next to me but Mrs. Schultz, <laughs> Jeannie Schultz, af years after Charles had passed away. And I'm holding this book and we're having a great conversation. And I said, oh, actually, I happen to have one of my books here. You can have it. And I hand it to this person and says, a peanuts for the 21st century. And I'm handing it to Mrs. Charles Schultz. And I'm like, oh, boy, I mean, it's just humiliating and embarrassing it's like i know this isn't really true that's just what someone said <laughs> um, but she was also very gracious and and uh, and kind about it uh what's weird sometimes is when some people pull out things that are you would think oh that's so obscure no one's gonna no one's gonna get that reference but when they get that when they notice uh, something like that that's always very satisfying hmm I, mean, I guess that I mean that means people are paying attention, right? People care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and you want to write something that people. I wanted to write something that just you wouldn't read as a kid and and get a kick out of and forget. I wanted something that you could read your whole life, and every time you went back to it, you'd get something else out of it. You know, there's tons of jokes in Amelia that no kid's gonna get. Uh, they kind of know it's a joke, 
or maybe they don't even recognize it's a joke. I mean, the the school uh, in Amelia is Joe McCarthy Elementary, weeding out the wrong element since 1952. <laughs> I'm sure 90% of the kids went past that and it didn't matter. But someday they'll be in a, a history class and they'll hear about Joe McCarthy and they'll go, oh my God, I get it. <laughs> And that's so great. Just the thought of that happened is so great to me. I love that. <laughs> oh my goodness. So when you talk to folks and you get that feedback, does that does that feed you? Does that help bridge the gap? You know, like on those days where you're like, oh, it's been a couple of days since I've I've drawn. Does that help you kind of pick the pen back up? Yeah, but you can't rely on it because it's like it is a solitary existence. It is a solitary job. And you have to be able to go when those when it's not coming in you know i went through it for a period mm. between uh, the dumbest idea ever which came out in 2014 and my next book didn't come out to 2020 i mean i did disney stuff in between but my next big graphic novel and for all those years there's no feedback you know you're working in a i mean there's a feedback from the editor but that, and that was a whole nother story but uh <laughs> but there's no feedback from an audience so you don't know if you're on the right path or not you know it's a 300 page book on um, a 275 page book or whatever that's a lot of commitment to do when you don't know if it's working or if it's going to react with an audience or or anything so that and i think that's another reason why you know some people don't have that second book mm. right i mean it's a lot to do at once it's it's a lot worse to do it once than the day you're finished sit down and start the next one that's <laughs> that's the mark of i think a lifer versus someone who's dabbling. You know, I, when, you, when you were talking about that, that almost makes me think, because I've talked to several other artists, like various kinds, it almost makes me think that you have an advantage over them in that, like when I talk to musicians or people that uh, say like do sidewalk chalk, like chalk art, yeah, they're yeah. accustomed to getting feedback very yeah. rapidly and yeah. with great repetition. And so when COVID hit, like the wind just got sucked out of their sails, yeah. like motivation to keep going, to keep pursuing their art. I know a lot of them slowed down and some of them haven't necessarily even picked back up. But the idea yeah. of you're accustomed to toiling, <laughs> toiling in darkness for a while, I guess the, that kind of helped you sustain over there. Oh God, no, the, the pandemic, cartoonists were built to survive the pandemic. Oh, <laughs> sit on my ass in silence and draw comics for a few years? <laughs> No problem. No problem. <laughs> Hold my beer. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's wild uh, to to have the uh, the world you know crisis of our generation and be perfectly suited as a cartoonist. That's fine. I will sit here and draw my comics. Yeah, but you know what? I think, and especially with the things like sidewalk chalk and so where there's a, a performative element of it. I mean, well, anything that was performative uh, or performance based for those years. That had to be brutal, you know, people mm. trying to find, you know, doing comedy online. And it's like, oh, brutal, brutal. Yeah. They had to, yeah. Like, I can only imagine. Um, the, I mean, this is who I am. This is the the person I am. And then all of a sudden that just entirely goes away. That's, yeah. Ugh. Not only was it your identity, but the thing that, you know, fed you, like, you yeah. Know, and was probably not easy to get to whatever level you were at. You know, whatever level you're at on something like that, it's just difficult. You know, when you're doing something that's outside the beaten path, when you're doing something that's, you know, you're following your own muse, any little thing can disrupt it. Because it, just being a freelancer of any kind is a very difficult life. Mm -hmm. uh, to do something um, where you really are trying to forge your own path and follow your own muse, anything can upset it. And <laughs> a pandemic... I'm sure it, it ended careers of all kinds in, in the arts, which is sad. I'm sure it also inspired some people to, you know, start creating or mm -hmm. start creating again, maybe. But I know for a lot of people, it wasn't easy for me. I could have gone another six, seven years. No problem. <laughs> My goodness. Well, I'm sure. I mean, all joking aside, I'm sure it affected affected you just like it did everybody else and I'm, I'm assuming that was reflected in your work as well right well i've been working on this book uh, i had started really in 2015 about living with depression and it really that's a bad way to describe it which i've been describing it that way since 2015 but what it actually is is about um 
fighting depression with creativity. Hmm. Um, and I had been working in notebooks and doing sketches and doing roughs for years and years. And then when this happened, I thought, oh, well, this is obviously a sign from the gods or the universe or, uh, that I should be focusing more on this. So I ended up getting about 120, 125 pages done of this thing over the course of the pandemic, which was you know, a lot because I'm not doing it for a client. I didn't sell it to a publisher because I don't want to hear anybody. I just don't want to hear it. Uh, you know, you think it should be a more blue? No, yeah, that's fine. No, I don't don't want to hear it. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is one of the this is a house of cards. And if someone breathes on it the wrong way, mm. it'll all fall apart. That is the downside of feedback. Like I see artists, I, I, all the kids that follow me, the young people that, that grew up reading Amelia or are still kids that read my books and they're posting on social media. Hey guys, give me feedback, give me feedback. And it's like, what this is, is actually they're, they're just trying to create a friend group, which I, which is wonderful. And they are creating a friend group and they're talking back and forth. Um, but you know, posting your, you're not going to get good feedback, you, you know, from random strangers on the internet, everybody has an opinion it's not the same as like being in an art class and having a professor explain right. why he has a comment about your drawing or whatever it is but but people crave it and i really don't like i really don't crave. like i said they uh my co-host son unpacking peanuts said hey do a thing where you ask uh, the audience what they'd like to see or any changes they'd like to make and i was clear with the <laughs> audience my co-hosts would like to hear this. I don't. <laughs> any praise you could send my way. Any any suggestions you could send to them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, I, I think I've uh, over the years taken um, a similar approach in that I don't necessarily need feedback. To me, it's always appreciated. Because yeah. like, uh, would you scream into the black void that is the internet for so long when something comes back? You know, it's, it's right. It's nice every now. And then. Right. Yeah. Sure. For sure. Yeah. A little bit keeps you going. Too much can uh, weigh you down. That's the, yeah. the sweet spot you gotta find. Ah, like so many in things in life, yeah. I guess uh, too much is a bad thing. I can dig yeah. it. <laughs> so you said you're doing one about fighting depression with creativity. Is that yeah. a very real and present story for you? Uh, it has been for my whole life. I mean, not so present at the moment because I'm. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good and I've had a long journey, you know, dealt with, with medicine and stuff like that, that finally got, got straightened out. Um, but yeah, really I've been dealing with this since I was a very young child. Didn't realize it till I was like 40. Like wow. I said, ah, there's no such thing as depression. Just you're sad. Just get up and do it. However, I feel miserable. I can't get out of bed today. Like I didn't realize I, it's such an odd thing to say, cause I'm not an unintelligent person, but just did not, did not make that connection or chose, I guess, chose not to make that connection, chose to reject that idea. And then when I realized what it was, it got real bad. Um, but that was a long time ago now. So I'm feeling, I'm feeling much better now. Uh, but I did come up with this, this story. It's not even, well, I mean, it is a story now, but it really was just the concept of an idea uh, for this book that I wanted different layers of creativity interacting with each other, with each other. different books within books hmm. that are all interacting with each other because the long, the larger goal is to somehow make reading the book for the reader be a primary experience as opposed to like a secondary experience. Like, so if you read a book about the Lord of the Rings, you had the secondary experience, you're reading it. Frodo mm -hmm. went on the walk, mm -hmm. right? You didn't, you read about it. But if you read the monster at the end of this book, with Grover, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if it's a children's book and it's just Grover from the Muppets telling you not to turn the page because there's a monster at the end of the book. <laughs> That's a primary experience. You're almost, you're interacting with Grover. Like you are in the story with that character. It's the simplest little book for the, the youngest possible audience. And it's a masterpiece of postmodern metafiction. And so that's what I wanted to do. It's it's a lot harder when you're dealing with a larger, more difficult theme, and it's like a 300 page book. But uh, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm literally trying to make the person feel like they went on a journey and feel better at the end. And if they feel better at the end of the story, maybe that can continue. You know, hmm. is this the book you think you wish you had read when you were 15? It's literally there is a part in the book with 
me sending a book back in time to my earlier self so that I can read it. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Hmm. That's exactly. Well, what ha here? Okay, if you really want to get into it, uh, without giving everything away, I, you know, I realized uh, at one point why I was depressed. That that it, that it, that it did stem from a, a horrific inf instance uh, or incident in my childhood that I blocked out. Hmm. When it all came back together, I, and I look back at Amelia Rules, I was like, "Oh my God, it's all there. Hmm. It's me fixing uh, the problem. It's me also talking to myself, explaining why my memory is hidden." There's a whole there's a whole um, sequence in Amelia Rules uh, Volume Four. Where there's a story in there called. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's Amelia's family story. And oh, it's called When the Past is a Present. It's the title of the book, actually. And it's her family story. And it's told through comic strips, the last hundred years of comic strips, as if each decade was a generation of her family. Hmm. And so it's drawn in the style of a comic that was popular at the time, starting at like the Cats and Jammer Kids and going all the way up to like Kathy. But I, I created it in a way so that you could pull panels out of those strips and on the last page, reassemble them, and it makes an entirely new strip. And hmm. that new strip has a hidden picture of Amelia in it. I don't know why I wanted to do that. I was obsessed with that idea. It it was very, very difficult to do because it's such a technical exercise. It's hmm. nothing like hmm. writing a story. Um, you know, you start at the beginning and go to the end and put some jokes, and it was very, very difficult. And it wasn't until I realized after that, like, oh, that's a recovered memory. I was I was trying to show my own brain how a comic book could reveal a hidden memory. And it was very then like probably it was years after that, though, it all it happened in my real life. And I realized, oh, that's what this has been about the whole time. Uh, so now that I kind of know all that stuff, working on this this new book, which right now that it's called In the Real Dark Night, because I just want to do a comic book called Dark Night and irritate <laughs> every fanboy in the world <laughs> like oh like that alone is just reason to do it um but i now that i know what i'm doing uh i think i can really get something done <laughs> now that i understand what the theme is what really has been the thing that's been in the back of my mind my whole life and motivating me I wasn't even really aware of it now that i'm aware of it i want to i want to at least make this one book where it is not even the central theme it is what it's about like from the way the characters are drawn through the way that's lettered everything about it is this and um yeah i think my goal is to get it done this year I, it will, won't it'll take a while to be published after that of course but mm. my goal is to get the work done this year i think that is one of the single most beautiful things i've ever heard on this podcast Aww. the idea that there's this hidden truth that you've created for yourself and you're just waiting for yourself to be ready to hear it like yeah. that is that's um that's so you know it's so funny like that that hits homes with me because like occasionally my wife will tell me like um this person uh has xyz going on in their life and they just haven't figured it out i was like how are you even like where is that even coming from and so the joke is with us i was like all right we'll write that down and put it into an envelope uh and uh have it ready so when that person comes to realization we'll just hand it to them <laughs> it's like everybody else saw it and was ready for it and just we were waiting for you to catch up and like i had never the idea that you could subconsciously do that for yourself that is like oh that is profound because they say it, like that stuff sits in the body right like that your body remembers even if your mind doesn't Yes. And the moment of it, it was literally there were there were all these things, the moments in my life where I'd be like, boy, that's a weird, that's weird. Like, why did that happen? That seems like a really strange thing. And there were a number of these things. And then they clicked one day. It's just one little thing set it off. And then all these strange things that didn't make no sense clicked together hmm. like gears. I was like, oh, my God, that's what it is. And uh, and it was a relief. <laughs> Like, mm. oh thank god but then and then like after processing that and it got bad for then it was like oh this is definitely a book this is definitely <laughs> this will be a really cool book yeah i i mean i love the the story of that journey i've heard it described as that point where you're figuring out everything that's um that you want to change and everything is yeah. just like in flux in your mind they call it the the messy middle because yeah. it does 
everything just gets messy. Somebody's uh, described it to me like uh, you live in a snow globe and somebody just shook it up. Boy, yeah, that's a great like, way to describe it. Very it just, much. You could hardly tell up from down. Everything's yes. crazy, but on the I other end of it, it's better. I used right? to describe it as head full of bees. Head full of bees. That's another yeah. really good it's one. Just like, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah thank yeah. God that period's over. That wasn't a great period. That was not yeah. great. It also might just explain why there was six years to between books, you know. But genuinely, that's in my experience, that's the kind of thing people need to hear. Right? Like yeah. head full of bees, somebody might hear that and that phrase clicks and they understand and they can right. uh, experience growth from it. It's so funny. There's just little little ripples, little things people are willing to put out into the world. I think that's uh, you writing this book, basically compiling compiling a uh i don't know is it like uh is it like the uh the pirates map from the goonies that uh there's a little, there's some people a, can follow there's always a you know there's always room for little goonies first off and <laughs> I, I, you know, so so i could absolutely see that well that's the other trick though is that um yeah i mean i know what you're saying there is that element of it where but you have to work them into it first it just seems like a story it's just a regular old story. And then, you know, the weirdness comes in. Then it feels like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm a character in this. I'm going on this journey. And if you're a character in the book, you know, that changes you. You know, if you feel those things directly. And I and I think, well, maybe it'll be for someone who's going through it. And that hopefully will be helpful. And, but maybe also it'll just be for someone who's going through it with someone or next to someone and mm. doesn't know how to deal with it. Right. Because there's no manual. Um, and that's really hard too. And then the last thing I just want to do is I want to make it hilarious. I wanted to make it, I want to make it the funniest book about depression. ever. <laughs> I want it just because that seems like a challenge. Right. <laughs> and also that's what someone needs. Like if I want to make, and, it, it's a really crude, not crude, but it's a little beneath me joke about 200 <laughs> pages into it, but it'll get a laugh. And I know whoever need will, they'll need it at that point. So it's like, all right, good. <laughs> yeah. That's for me. That's part of the healing process. It's like cathartic for me. Like oh, yeah. I have, as long as I can remember at funerals, I make very crass jokes and things like that because I don't know why it's, it generally is like a pressure relief valve for me. And yeah. It takes something that's bad and hurtful and it allows me to just kind of release some of that stuff. I usually make those jokes very quietly to the person <laughs> sitting next to me. I try, you know, I don't, too disrespectful. I'm not like completely cutting up in the middle of a service or whatever, but yeah, I just, I think yeah, he, everything should be uh, uh joke fodder, you know? Oh, absolutely. You know, well, the most, the most, my my partner on uh, Unpacking Peanuts, Michael Cohen, once said he hates humor. And this, this is something I think about every day when I'm writing. Because <laughs> as a humorist, he hates humor. And uh, I'm like, what do you mean by that? He's like, because nothing you will, no movie you'll ever go see, no book you'll ever read will be as funny as just hanging out with your friends. And so, I'm, but that's like a great goal. Like, oh, okay, well, I just want to make a book that's at least almost as funny as hanging out with your friends, you know? Um, that's hard to do because you have to really uh, develop a rapport with the reader. It's not just about getting those characters to work together, which is its own challenge, but you also have to get the, uh, you know, the the rapport with the reader. Uh, and, but when it works, it's really, really satisfying. Yeah, for sure. I could totally, I can totally, I think I know what you mean. Like before I've, I've come home from work and I used to listen to a lot of audio books and stuff like that. I, yeah. I commuted a lot. And I remember my wife, this has happened a couple of times. She's asked me, eh, what happened today? And I would tell her about something that happened to a friend of mine, blah, blah. And then I was like, wait a minute. No, no, no. That was, that, I, that was actually in my book today. Like I had, <laughs> I had like, I don't know. I just gotten so used to these people talking in my head that the yeah. lines sort of got blurred. I was like, that is such a bizarre experience. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Like I feel uh, slightly less bad about that type of experience when it's coming from like, let's say a book or a novel, because that is your re real genuine connection with that author, right? That, that author made that thing seem so real that you thought it happened in front of you. I find it weird when it has happening all the time with corporate icons, uh, like, you know, where, where they don't feel the connection. It's, it's, it's the another reason why I wanted to do this podcast about Schultz is I wanted a forefront 
the cartoonist in people's minds when they thought about comics and creativity. You know, don't be, I mean, it's okay to say you're a fan of Batman, whatever, that's fine. <laughs> but like, you know, people made Batman, right? And and they're not just, uh, you know, cogs in a, well, they kind of are just cogs in a machine, but like you need to elevate them a little bit. Um, you know, to re, uh, respect and celebrate the people who are creating that kind of connection uh, you have with those characters because it's not coming out of nowhere, you know? I think I think that is very fascinating that uh, uh, that you want somebody to know who the person behind the pin is. Yeah. Oh. And something that's a little bit tricky these days is, um, you know, I'll, oh, frequently lately it's been coming up, can I separate the art from the artist because you figure out stuff about the artist you wish you never knew. And it's yeah. like, I, it like for me that usually colors, yeah. you know, it puts a, it puts a, a filter over everything I see coming from them. And it's like, I used to really enjoy this. I wish I didn't know that thing and it. Um, and I think for some people, uh, that's terrific. Like you behind the pin, like the person, like you're fascinating. You've got a lot to say. You've got a lot that can do good for the world, you know? And well, I'm sure you yes. can't say that for everybody. Well, you know, one thing I always think about, and this sort of gets me in trouble, so I don't say this out loud on podcasts ever. But <laughs> uh, talking to a friend of mine once, and he was talking about um, being on the, well, he, it, was, it was a two-point conversation. The first, he was working on a, a comic for Marvel Comics. And he said, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm working on character X. What an honor. And I was like, it's not an honor. It's a job. And, I, and so I came up with this simple <laughs> trick for people out there because they want you to think it's an honor. Replace whatever character it is. Let's say you get to write a Luke Skywalker comic and you think, oh, my gosh, I am so honored. I get to write Luke Skywalker. Replace the character's name with Hamburglar. <laughs> and see if you're still honored <laughs> because it's a, just a corporate trademark and whatever makes this story great isn't coming from the trademark it's coming from you the stuff that came in the dark knight returns that made it great came from frank miller you know uh that's the important thing and if you start thinking he didn't think it was an honor he thought oh i'm gonna do whatever i want <laughs> all right and it, and it made something that had impact same guy in same conversation said something like, or I don't remember exactly how it came up, but it was something like, if you reach out or if someone comes up to you and says, I read your book and it inspired me to, um, you know, become a Peace Corps volunteer or whatever. And you go, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so on. But then someone else comes up and says, hey, you know, your book caused someone to, you know, do something bad. Let's say, yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. You can't then go, oh, well, that has nothing to do with me. Like it's a, it's a, it's a, di I, I, I understand that art doesn't make someone do a bad thing. A bad thing is going to happen. But if you put the thought in the world and you're going to take the credit for the good things that come out of it. I don't know how you can escape taking some responsibility for some of the bad things, <laughs> not saying, not censoring anything, never censoring anything because difficult things need to be talked about all the time. But while you're talking about them, what's the what's the email attachment to it? You know, you have the what's what's the overall, you know, you have the story you're doing you have, or the piece of art you're doing. And it might be a dark, negative, even violent thing. But what's the overall? You can experience a dark, violent piece of art and come out feeling better or come out feeling enlightened. Um, or you could just come out feeling that you experience something dark and violent. You know, I think it's really important for the artist to always realize if you're putting that stuff out in the world, you have to also have a good meta story that makes it a positive experience overall, even when you're dealing with really, really dark stuff. Hmm. That's interesting. Here's a great example. Pulp oh. Fiction. Pulp yeah. Fiction a, is a tragedy if you tell it in the right order. <laughs> All he does is switch the last act and the middle act and you leave feeling elated and energized and alive right it doesn't it's not it's not that's just clever that's just good writing and, and good art and but if you switch it and you do it the standard way it's a, it, the movie doesn't work at all it's a completely different experience same exact stuff happens 
strange. Yeah, that's interesting. I I hadn't really thought about the idea of uh, you could take the good on, but you also have to bear some responsibility for the bad. I, I, I guess to to some degree or another, right? Sometimes I think people are, uh, they have a narrative in their head and they're always looking for things that just fit that. And yeah, and I definitely do want to be your clear. Control. No art is causing someone to yeah. go in and shoot up a movie theater or something Yeah, like for that. sure, for sure. But, and I don't think anybody should ever be censored for anything they want to say, you know, within our standards of democracy. Um, but I'm saying as an artist, you do have a responsibility. Hamlet's dark. Hamlet's beautiful, though, and Hamlet's a life-affirming, ultimately, work of art. So just be like Shakespeare. That's all I'm saying. Just put <laughs> a little extra effort in and be Shakespeare. It shouldn't be so hard, people. I like it. I like it. Because <laughs> I think so often, um, yeah, we are we are quick to just think, you know, I, I only want to look at the positive and completely ignore the negative. And then maybe reel that back in time a little bit when I'm creating the work. How can I tweak this? How can I tune that to to put a little a little zhuzh on it, a little something extra that could make this, I guess, maybe more of a, a positive experience or help people learn a lesson from it or really pull something interesting yeah. or intriguing? Yeah, and yeah, you know, and just comes away with something, just feel, having felt enriched rather than depleted. You know, I think art should be giving something some, to someone rather than taking it away. And sometimes, sometimes art just, I say, well, I endured that for a series for a while and now it's over but i'm drained and you know i love art that makes me uh a want to go live life but also makes me want to make art too, make more art so yeah yeah for sure well i mean some stuff can be like um you know you think about like uh horror fiction or whatever yeah it's you know it kicks that part in our brain where we might die but we don't and right. everything's right. Yeah, okay right, right. and we start like why do we why do people love riding roller coasters you know right. it's <laughs> it's on rails and it's safe. And so it lets us kind of play in that space. You well, know, and that's, that we yeah, on. that is a really important thing too, especially when you're dealing where, when you're writing for kids and you have to kind of keep it in mind and you have to push against because people don't want to see art that way, but it's a very big uh, reason art exists is that you can process something in a safe way uh, that you might experience later in life or might see experience later in life. Um, and new, if you have some sort of, trial run through art that's hugely hugely helpful you know so yeah that is another reason too mm. but that again will come to, even if even if that's through a work of art that is not from hell by alan moore or something whatever right it's nihilistic for the most part there's like a four page sequence at the end that makes the whole thing transcendent if you, you've watched you've read 600 pages of brutal awful death in Victorian England, but there's a little sequence where, like, the main, I don't want to give it away if anyone's not read it, but the, the killer is uh, having a vision after death and and sees something that spins the story that you just read in a different direction. And you then leave going, whoa, what an experience I just had. That's I, I thought I was going this way and I, I felt all this dark, intense negativity, but at the end it was burst like a bubble. And you mm. leave and you're like, oh, that was amazing. This is the book, by the way. Not the, I've never seen the movie. But mm. um, yeah, so I mean, there's tons and tons of ways to do that. And the great artists seem to always be able to do it, no matter mm. what the subject. So something else uh, that you talked about is like feeling honored. Like I, I'm honored to do this thing. Uh, I've sort of felt that in my life before because I think... It, for me, it was this, like I sometimes will put uh, goals in front of me or like yeah. measuring sticks. How do I measure myself? And it was like, uh, I'm a author for this online learning platform. So it's not even remotely the same to what you do. Um, they just call us authors for some unknown reason. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you wrote something, you're an author as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway, uh, in that, they asked me to do this one that was particularly difficult. And I was like, man, that's cool that they gave me the nod to do this. Because, you know, it's like, to me, it felt like proof of you know, what I had achieved thus far that they would put this important task in yeah, my yeah. hands. And then later I found out it's because probably nobody else wanted to do it because the more <laughs> difficult stuff, uh, beginners don't watch that. So you make less money off of it. I was like, shit, <laughs> now I've learned. Now I've got it figured out. Anyway, right, right, right. it was still like, you know, I felt I had attained a goal and I was wondering, um, Scholastic, like writing for Scholastic, that is a huge name that I think everybody would recognize. Did that... Did that give you like, 
Like, how did that make you feel? Did you feel kind of validated, vindicated? Oh, I feel vindicated because, you know, in, <laughs> it, when I started Amelia in 2001, it's not like um, the comic book industry was uh, apathetic towards young girl characters or kids books or humor books or especially color humor books. They were outright hostile to all of those <laughs> things. You know, they had just spent 20 years trying to convince everybody that comics were, um, you know, dark, edgy literature for grown men. And I came up with familiar rules, which is the opposite of everything that they were, they were trying to do. And, you know, we were just going along, just barely being able to get the next issue out. Right. And, um, I remember being in um, in uh, it was at San Diego Comic Con and we were in a Radisson hotel lobby and I was with Harold Buckholtz, who is also a co-host now on my Unpacking Peanuts podcast. But at the time, he was just like a print broker. And I said, hey, you know what we need to do with this? And he's like, what? We need to one of those those pieces of paper you used to get in school where they'd put books on it. And you could order them. He's like the Scholastic Book Club. I'm like, yeah, we need to be in those. He's like. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is long before the Scholastics had a graphics line or anything like that. Um, and then, so, but I, I, and I was always in the back of my mind that we were going to do that. And then a couple of years passed and I'm like, I really, that's what I want to do. I want Amelia to be in the Scholastic book clubs. So I went on their website and I mean, this is a long, long time ago. And I was looking and it's like, uh, you know, Scholastic book clubs and book fairs don't ever contact us we do not take submissions we don't want to hear from you never contact us we <laughs> hate you leave us alone and here's our phone number so i'm like come on how serious can they be right <laughs> so i called uh, from my office i was working at a tv station at the time and i said hi my name is jimmy gownley i do a comic book series called amelia rules and they're like oh i'm sorry we don't do comic book series i, said, I completely understand click so i waited two weeks called back hi my name is jimmy gownley i do a graphic novel series called amelia rules really <laughs> And it was just that. <laughs> and they, so, yeah, so, so they gave me a process and said, all right, if you can get book clubs or book fairs rather, which are the actual, you know, parties at the school or the, if you get book fairs to carry your book, uh, we'll order some for the book clubs. But th I didn't know what this was. This was like sending me to the sharks, like, you know, there, but he liked it. The guy who ran Scholastic Book Clubs and Book Fair or Book Fairs, fairs rather loved it. And ordered seventy five thousand copies. Of Holy the cow! Best of Amelia book we did, and then it ended up selling like eighty six thousand copies through Scholastic. And uh, again, yeah, then I ended up getting published by Scholastic for my memoir and my my last book. So it was a great sense of vindication. I I spent years going to library conferences and uh, just giving out free books and talking to librarians and saying, yeah, that this is the art form for kids. If you want kids to learn to love to read, this is the art form that does it. Hmm. And they're reading at a higher grade level. You know, an average Marvel comic when I was a kid in the 80s at her DC comic was written at the 11th grade level, which is the same as the New York Times. But I was getting crap for reading the new Teen, Teen Titans or whatever. But the reason I read everything now, you know, I wrote to a publisher in Serbia and I had to PayPal him money just to get <laughs> this book. So, like, I read everything. It's because I grew up loving and reading those comics and they really hmm. pushed me to read at, at read beyond what I would normally be reading. So, so it cool. was, yeah, it was vindicating, but it's not, but at the same time, you know, you can't go in and go, well, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me and I'll do whatever these people say, you know, you still have to have your vision and you still have to push back if there's things that matter to you mm -hmm. and you might have to do it for six years, whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no it wasn't bad <laughs> but it's definitely and i i mean you also have the moniker of um uh new york times best-selling author as yes. well which i mean talk about you know like notches on your measuring stick that's got to be a huge one for any author right that's pretty cool that's yeah i will say that was pretty cool that was definitely <laughs> a day to have champagne but it, but like all things in my life uh, it wasn't without a sense, a little bit of uh, hilarity and tragedy. Uh, I got a call. It was actually my editor at Scholastic and I was talking to him on the phone and then we hung up and then I immediately got an email said, oh, I forgot to congratulate you on being a bestselling author. And I'm like, what? I, I didn't know what. So I immediately went to the New York Times website 
and typed it in and it wasn't there. And I was like, oh, he made a mistake. This is humiliating. He thinks oh, I'm no. somebody else and I'm going to have to say, oh, actually, it wasn't me. But it was actually he they just got the list for the next week's. Uh, so I ha couldn't see it on the website. And uh, but I told my agent, I'm like, oh, it was so embarrassing. He said I made the and she's like, oh, no, you did. It's just next week. So, uh, you couldn't tell me. So, oh, I didn't think of it. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> it's so humdrum Monday yeah. to them, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's and it'll so be in cool. my obituary, I guess, you know? Is that is it going to be on your tombstone? Yeah, maybe. It'll say, Jimmy Ganley had one good week in 2012. That's what it's <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like, um, that's like they say, uh, you know, whenever you see your doctor's uh, diploma on the wall, you don't ask him what his grades were, just that yeah, he right. has it up there, right? <laughs> it's like that Seinfeld line, someone's graduating at the bottom of these medical classes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it doesn't matter. You got You got the thing. You get uh, you get to lord that over everybody for the and you know that's like when somebody gets a doctorate, you know, or a PhD, they get to call themselves doctor from then right. on. So, right, do it. Yeah, it definitely helps when you're putting a an email uh, to introduce yourself to someone, or you know, just put on the cover of the book or whatever like that. Um, it's funny. We got a quote from Jeff Kinney who does Diary of a Wimpy Kid for the back of my memoir, and it specifically had to be on the back. And the reason was he's like, look, I hate to be a jerk. But I did give a quote to someone else and they put my name and the quote bigger than the title and the author's name on the front. I was like, oh, well, that would never happen because I'm an egomaniac. So it <laughs> would never happen, Jeff. You're on the back. Don't worry. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, it's an, uh, it's an elite club. I'm, I, I assume it actually opens a lot of doors, which is... Uh, which sometimes, I mean, in so many things in life, just getting your foot in the door is like the hardest part. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's well, I, when I uh, first actually around the time I made the New York Times bestseller list, it was I was, I was doing tons of interviews and uh, a lot of the interviews were by podcasts of other cartoonists. And after a while, I started getting vaguely insulted because it was kind of like, how did you? become a new york Times. <laughs> how can as if i could somehow list these things and if you do these things in this order it'll happen but here's like look how like you need an agent right how so how do you get an agent well here's how i got an agent i self-published four amelia rules graphic novels not self-published on like the amazon th this is long before any of that stuff hmm. i had to really print them in the co in thousands of copies and how to find a way to distribute them to comic shops, libraries. We were distributing to Borders and Barnes and Noble. When Borders and Barnes and Noble started their kids' graphic novel section in 2007, Amelia was one of the four books they started with and it was self-published. They didn't even know, right? It, 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 so I, I had published four of those 200 page books before I was at Book Expo America. I was on a panel and they said, and they had sent us the um, questions in advance. And the question was, what comic, the last question, what com, kids comic from the past should be brought back? And I was going to say power pack. So I'm sitting there and, on the little, uh, you know, dais, and they get to me. And right before I'm supposed to answer and say power pack, something pops into my head and goes, say Zot. So I said, Zot by Scott McCloud. And the place went nuts. And I'm like, right, see, Zot's great. Everybody should go out and read Zot. It's been out of print for 20 years. Just vamped on it. Well, Scott McCloud's agent was in the audience when I said that. Not only that, she had just had a meeting with Harper Collins, who were not crazy. I don't think they were going to necessarily pass, but they were not super hyped on Zot. And then she, those two people were in that panel. And I said that. And suddenly my whole life changed. She came to me afterwards and was like, my name's Judy. I'd love to uh, talk to you a little bit. What are you doing? Thank you. And told me what had happened. You know, like, so thank you for uh, helping me out with that. Hmm. What do you do? I showed her my books and she's like, if you need an agent, I'd love to be your agent. And then that's what happened. We auctioned uh, two years later. We auctioned Amelia off uh, a bunch of different publishers uh, bid on it. And, but you can't replicate that. You can't tell someone, all right, well, first off, you have to spend years of your life publishing all these books and then randomly yell Zot at various, <laughs> like, I'm, you know, you can't replicate that. Mm. It sounds like you were just putting in the work, just putting in the reps. Yeah. Well, that's all it is. I just love doing it. 
you know i love doing mm. it i love drawing on paper i love when a page comes out good it makes me happy you know that's the other thing though is that with social media and stuff with kids i think they get that dopamine hit from posting it then mm. we used to have to wait to get something print, even if it was just a zine or a mini comic right you'd have to put it together and then you've got the dopamine hit it held in your hand and someone bought it for a dollar or whatever now i think you get a bunch of likes and it's the same thing but the problem is you're not making an a, a work of art that has those legs that will get you to the New York Times bestseller list because likes on Facebook or or Twitter aren't really going to get you unless you get millions of them and then maybe you'll get a book deal out of it. But that's it's a difficult road. Yeah, for sure. It seems like nowadays you have to do uh, everything. You just yeah. have to do everything and keep doing everything uh, over and over and toiling in, uh, you know, in virtual uh solitude for a while yeah and it sucks you know for, when uh, artists are generally you know solitary people and suddenly you have to be you know your own press agent and your own pr person and you have to like the social media stuff i eventually just withered it just down to twitter because I, I just don't enjoy it it's it's not fun to me i love doing podcasts i love to obviously i love talking but yeah. but posting stuff and pretending like and the Kardashian just doesn't do it for me <laughs> <You know? laughs> or anybody else for that matter. No one needs to see me in a thong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, there's a difference between need and want Jimmy. So <laughs> some people, <laughs> some people may want to see it. So just keep that in mind. I don't think very many, I think they're sickies if they do. If they do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I try not, I try not to yuck on anybody's yum, right? <laughs> you you're into it. thing. True. You're you into a what? thing, you're into a thing. That's right. Who are we to judge? Too much right. judging already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, um, talk, we, I mean, we've talked ad nauseum about drawing and stuff like that. Um, and that, <laughs> so I've been listening to your, I want to transition over to, see the smooth transition I'm doing here, over to your uh, Packing Peanuts podcast. You yeah, talk yeah. about how much you love to talk and stuff like that. And I was listening to uh, one of the, more recent ones. I don't know. I I, I kind of cherry pick usually when I'm listening yeah, to people. Yeah. So we're gonna first listening. I sort of just That's skip all I, over the place. You got a sample. That's how I do a podcast. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Um, but I was listening to uh, to one, and I think you were talking to like, well, I'm probably gonna get this title wrong. I think the curator of oh yeah the museum, Car yeah. cartoon and art museum, the Charles M. Schultz yeah. uh, one, which you were um you were like an artist in residence there for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, right? for a God, week. Man, yeah done a that lot awesome. of stuff yeah. um but you guys i mean the the level of microscopic detail <laughs> you guys get into with some of this stuff is kind of mind-boggling like you you kept referring to sparky and i'm assuming that was his uh Schultz, his, yeah, his, his pet his name there and then i you... generally never do because i feel weird about that because i didn't know the guy <laughs> but all, everybody who works for the schultz uh you know organization they all call him sparky whether call they knew him, him or not yeah that was just his name. named after spark plug which was another cartoon character from barney google a horse of all things <laughs> oh my gosh how fun yeah, yeah. yeah like i said the minutiae uh, the level of details you guys get. And then the one thing that really got me is you guys talked for like 15 minutes. I know what this about, is going to be. Go ahead. About his Esterbrook 914 pen nib. Yes, the radio 914. pin yes, I knew nib. That and it has to be the radio version because there's another version yeah. and it's not that. And no. they've done reproductions. <laughs> but then there's the, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. you guys are super nerds. And I love every second super of it. Super nerds. Oh it my God. It was the best. It is the best. I... <laughs> I have no affiliation with cartooning. You guys are such weirdos. I love listening to it. It is like oh the best thing ever. Oh, I could spend six, seven hours talking about the 914 radio. Nib. Yeah, it's these little <laughs> things. And that's what I mean about it. It's a little bit like being a Jedi. You know, that was a more elegant weapon for a more civilized time. <laughs> 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 914. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, take me, take me through this this podcast i guess give me give me the elevator pitch and then how you guys got this thing started yeah well the elevator pitch is it's three cartoonists that are reading every single comic strip uh, drawn by charles schultz from 1950 to 2000 in peanuts and then we talk about um you know our favorites so we talk about various trends things that are going on in schultz life a ton about the craft of cartooning and and what it took to make this masterpiece and what it was, was, well, like we were talking just a moment ago, you know, I, I needed to figure out something to do some sort of promo without doing a ton of social media, because uh, I just don't like it. 
Uh, so I wanted to do a podcast. I had tried doing a podcast by myself. Um, and I think they're okay, but it's just very, very difficult to mm. just monologue. Mm -hmm. um, and with nothing to bounce off of. So I just thought, well, you know, there's all these watch alongs, you know, you watch every episode of Twin Peaks, watch every, every episode of Buffy or whatever. I thought, well, why don't we read every single episode of, uh, or, uh, you know, comic strip of peanuts. I was inspired. There's a comic or a comic book podcast called screw it. We're just going to talk about comics. And they just talked about like the Steve Ditko, um, Spider-Man comics and their two brothers. And it reminded me of what Michael was saying about, you know, the best humors just when you're hanging out with your friends. I thought, oh, this is great. We could we could make a show of just hanging out with our friends. But, you know, I did the first episode and uh, we did a, like two or three, I guess, in 2019. And I just didn't have uh, the bandwidth to produce it because it needs tons of editing. I mean, some of these recording sessions we did go on for like four and a half hours. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, th you think that's a lot of talking about the pen nib. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the hosts, Michael Cohen, uh, his his wife, Liz Sumner, was already a podcaster and a producer of podcasts. So she said, if I edit it and produce it, will you guys pick it up again? And I hmm. instantly said, absolutely, yes. So she's the reason we were able to actually make it and like do a a weekly schedule, you know? Yeah. And I've, the, I love it. The fact that you guys are keeping a weekly schedule is, uh, is awesome, too, because that is, I mean, one... One, it's finding to me that like the secret is finding interesting personalities that that really mesh well together. You guys have done a tremendous job of that, and each one of you is a very good speaker. Like, I legitimately like having you in my ears, like oh. listening to it. Like, yeah. uh, it, it's really good. But then, um, yeah, just the level of detail with which you guys go through there, the banter, I, it's really good chemistry. Chemistry is the word I was slowly well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, getting they, towards. What's what the thing that's fascinating about it to me is you know michael's a jewish atheist uh, you know uh, and harold is an evangelical christian and there's me and <laughs> uh, i and they're polar opposites except they're the exact same person and i feel like <laughs> that is so interesting and i i just love that as a model of just communication and talk about judging right we were talking about earlier like there's none of that even though these people are totally different people hey, because we're just coming together and talking about this thing that we love more than anything, you know, mm. it's so much fun to do. Every it's, if we don't record for whatever reason on a Tuesday, like throws my whole week off and I'm like in a bad mood. <laughs> I think it's cool too. Like the, the fact that you guys, you know exactly what's coming. So yeah. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this week's set of strips. We're going to discuss that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's, that's awesome because it keeps you moving. But you guys always go off script, right? Yes. It's, it's you go down, you go down rabbit holes, and, stuff, and to me, that's where the really interesting stuff happens. And you're you're not afraid to do that, which I think is is really great too. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's that's primarily probably me encouraging that. I know Michael is his job. One of his jobs is to rein it back in when it gets too far away, and he does that by quoting a famous Lucy line, which is. <laughs> We've had spaghetti at our house three times this month, which just lets me know that, oh, okay, we don't need to talk about James Joyce anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Something else uh, I really enjoy is, and I think this is so like fun and fascinating and people take it different directions, is that whenever you do have like a guest on there, you ask them, hey, uh, I want you to tell us about your uh, five favorite, yeah. your top, or you say top five, which... Yeah. I mean, what is there, like 17,000? 17,897. Yeah. Oh, God. Nerd. Nerd alert. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, I mean, so it's like to say pick your top five. It's pretty, it's pretty tough. Um, the one I I thought was interesting, because so, everybody interprets it differently, right? Some people yes. take to heart. These are truly my favorite. And then uh, you had one guest that was, um, oh, I'm going to, mm, I can't remember the name. It was like Peanuts as a Religion or. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stephen Lind, who wrote. Um... A Charlie Brown religion. Yes. yes there yes. you are. Charlie Brown religion. Yeah. And Great he book, picked, by the way, really, he good. picked ones. Oh, talk about numbers, nerds and statistics. Oh my gosh. You guys, I'm sure we're in heaven. Yeah. Um, that guy, he's something else. Yeah. 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 But he, you know, it was, it was a, it was a book about religion and how it kind of correlated with there and explorations between, which I found interesting. Um, but he picked five that really were kind of like, I guess, 
um, quintessential examples of, of mm-hmm. this thing uh, as far as religion goes or that thing and introduction here or there. And uh, I found that really, because there's, I mean, will you guys ever run out of things to talk about inside of Peanuts? Because there's so much nuance, so much variety. No, no. But Michael Harold and I literally could have a box of cereal and talk about it for 20 years. It wouldn't, we it would <laughs> never. I mean, you know, I know these guys now since the 90s uh, and we haven't shut up about any topic. So I'm sure we could keep going. Uh, my, my, I'm already nervous about getting to the end of 2000. We're only at 1967 and I'm already thinking, oh, what are we going to do after 2000? But there's a lot of stuff. I want to do things where we focus, uh, episodes where we just focus on one character, see how it you changed over time, that kind of thing. So now I think we'll be able to go for a good long time. That's cool. What and... a curious, Michael eventually aged or not, or just grew out of peanuts as a reader. So he hasn't read any of the later stuff. Uh, I'm very curious about that. Cause I'm not sure he'll love it as much as the early stuff, but well, and that's fresh eyes. I, I like the idea yeah, there yeah. because now there's a lot of new interpretations. He can look at stuff oh. uh, in a way that maybe you guys didn't or whatever. Yeah. But I think the real question here is if you guys are going to sit down and talk for 20 years with a box of cereal, what box of cereals are going to be? Oh, Apple Jacks. There's no question. Apple Jacks. Apple Jacks oh. is the best, man. No, the best is actually the milk in the Apple Jacks bowl. After the Apple Jacks bowl. <laughs> yeah, you're talking. Oh, my gosh. This reminds me of uh, uh, a line from Community where he's like talking about um, you know, like the cereal. He like puts, I think, it's like chocolate milk or something in it. Uh, to drink it like uh, afterwards and he goes special drink special drink <laughs> and he goes and one day you'll know you'll know it by its true name <laughs> diabetes, diabetes yes. yeah. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh lord have mercy special drink. <laughs> apple jacks is it's a solid choice it's a solid choice well, you're in like dr pepper era right er- area is, is that your thing down there i uh i i grew up in waco texas which is the birthplace of dr pepper so it's you talk about religions Man, well, gotta... I didn't realize that I went down, I was doing a, an event down there years ago and everywhere I went, you want Dr. Pepper, you want Dr. Pepper. And like, uh, no one else is caught. Con- I mean, there's nothing wrong with Dr. Pepper, but no, it's not the go to everywhere until I realized, oh, it's from here. I see. I see. Got yeah. it. <laughs> we got the museum and everything. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I've got life hacks. So when you go to the museum, they have the, uh, the old soda, soda fountains, right? Like they oh, have cool. syrup jerks back there. And you tell them to give you extra syrup. So they'll do like an extra pump or two of syrup. Oh, nice. It is delicious. And then also you can get a sundae. And so you get vanilla ice cream and they just put the syrup out of the fountain. Into oh, it. No, are you serious? No carbonation. It is amazing. They used to actually sell just the syrup in bottles so you could do that at home. But then uh, corporate caught on to it and they're like, no, you <laughs> You can't, you can't do that anymore. Can't do that, all right. So, yeah, uh, people then, use it for soda streams and stuff, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they actually might. But I had a friend whose sister worked at a gas station, and uh, she could get the syrup out of, like, the fountains. So it was like, you know, there's nice. where there's a will, there's a way. There's always a way. <laughs> yeah. I would encourage you to befriend a gas station employee, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, well, uh, just another one, you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you haven't already, I Seven mean, or eight, I already have, but <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they're like Pokemon. You got to collect them all. Got to catch them all. My goodness. My, how we have gone down a rabbit hole. <laughs> all right. Uh, to be honest, Jimmy, I have eaten a ton of your time. I try and be respectful oh, because uh, time to me is the most precious commodity. And uh, I really appreciate yours. So, right here at the end. I like to ask people if there is some way you would like people to interact with you on, say, social media or something specific you want them to go to, check out. You've got a lot of stuff cooking. So what would you what would you yeah, have it, people do? Uh, if you want to connect with me directly, uh, I'm on Twitter at Jimmy Gownley, J-I-M-M-Y-G-O-W-N-L-E-Y. Uh, or you could follow if you're interested in the Peanuts podcast, you could follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Unpack Peanuts. Uh, but that's not me. That's, you know, the other guys. <laughs> all right you don't want to you don't want to promote your uh website or any nah, place where they're selling books or anything nah, just follow <laughs> me on twitter all right well i'm gonna encourage people to go and check out amelia rules as well as all the other stuff and i've noticed on twitter you started um posting kind of some little shots of some of the new stuff you're working on yeah yeah yeah, if so. you want, that's where I go post for my own little dopamine hits. That's where I post my upcoming art, you know? So, yeah, so you'll see some, there's a, there's a new Amelia book in the works. So you can go on there and you can see some new Amelia Rules drawings and lots of stuff from that that depression book is, is up there as well. 
words okay. removed for the most part because I don't want to spoil it, but you'll get a, a little glimpse. Gotcha. And I refuse to read things. I am like an audio person, which is mm -hmm. why I do podcasts because I love listening to voices, but I am going to break with the mold and I'm definitely going to go and um, get a copy of that one. I want to, I want to check that one out. Fantastic. Excellent. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, this has been really, really fun. I, I just enjoyed it and uh, I love your podcast and I want you to keep it up. I appreciate it. We need good it. podcasts to keep cartoonists occupied while they're drawing. There you go. Oh, man. I, I just got my dopamine hit for the week. There you uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let me click stop on all this stuff. <laughs>